In this video, we want to use electronic structure calculations to predict the enthalpies of reaction for the overall process. Let's look at each step again in some detail to see how we might accomplish this. The first step involves the dissociation of the halogen molecule to form two halogen atoms, which are free radicals. One complication in electronic structure calculations is that in the molecule here, every molecular orbital has two electrons. We have what we call a restricted wave function. On the other hand, on the right hand side, we have two unrestricted wave functions because in at least one of the atomic orbitals for the halogen, we have only one electron. So we see on the left side, we have restricted. On the right hand side, we have unrestricted, which causes challenges as far as the computational accuracy to predict the enthalpy of this particular step. In the second step, we have the alkane, which has an even number of electrons and therefore a restricted wave function. Each molecular orbital has two electrons. Reacting with a free radical, which has an unrestricted wave function because it has one atomic orbital with just one electron. And then on the right hand side, we have the free radical uh, from the alkane. So they have an alkyl free radical, which has an unrestricted wave function. And then we have the hydrohalogen, which has a restricted wave function. So this is an even more complicated step, even though we have restricted and restricted, unrestricted and unrestricted, but here we're mixing and matching restricted and unrestricted wave functions for both the reactants and the products. So we see we have challenges in computing delta H for the first reaction, which is called delta H number one, and for the second step, which we're going to call delta H number two. In the third and final step, as reactants, we have the alkyl free radical, the halogen free radical, each of which has an unrestricted wave function, combining to form the neutral compound, which is a haloalkane, which because it has an even number of electrons, has a restricted wave function. As you might predict, trying to compute this accurately, starting with two unrestricted wave functions and ending up with one restricted wave function, leads to very large challenges in the accuracy of delta H number three. So we see that we have some difficulties in each of the three steps and therefore possible sources of error in computing delta H1, delta H2, and delta H number three. Since all three steps take place as written in the stoichiometries that are written, let us try to simply add together all three reactions using Hess's law. So if we add together all of our reactants, we have one of the alkanes, we have one molecule of the halogen, we have one alkyl free radical, and we have two of the halogen free radicals. And this gives us our total on the reactant side. Next, we perform the same procedure of adding together all of our products. So we have one haloalkane, we have here. We have one hydrogen halide, HX. We have one alkyl free radical, R dot, and we have two of the halogen free radicals. So effectively what we've done is add together the first 
second and third equations. So the total enthalpy of reaction we have here is simply delta H1 plus delta H2 plus delta H3. We can treat any species which is identical on the reactant and product sides as if it were a spectator, for example. So we have a alkyl free radical here and one on this side, so we can cancel this one with that one. We have two um, halogen free radicals here and two halogen free radicals over here, so we can cancel those. And now we can add together to get effectively the overall reaction of free radical halogenation. So what does this give us? It gives us alkane plus the halogen giving the haloalkane plus the hydrogen halide. So we were able to combine three individual reactions which will have three different possible sources of error into a single equation. Even better we notice that this has an even number of electrons so it's a restricted wave function. This species has an even number of electrons so it's restricted just as well as the haloalkane and the hydrogen halide. So rather than having sources of error by using a combination of restricted and unrestricted wave functions, we're able to condense everything into a single equation that involves only restricted wave functions. So in our computations in this video of the enthalpies of reaction, we will in every case be computing using electronic structure calculations the appropriate version of this reaction in each case. Our simplest free radical halogenation will take place reacting a halogen, here we're showing, for example, fluorine, reacting with methane. And the result of the reaction that we get is methyl fluoride, or fluoromethane, plus hydrogen fluoride. The order of reactivity is that fluorine is by far the most reactive. In fact, in general, fluorine is so reactive that it reacts explosively so with such an exothermic uh, reactivity that uh, we get multiple substitution and in fact we have uh, obliteration of the molecule that it's uh, reacting with. So that in general, unless it's under very special circumstances, such as uh, a huge amount of uh, diluent gas, we generally find that uh, free radical halogenation by fluorine is too uh, aggressive to be commercially useful. Somewhat less reactive, we have chlorine. Chlorine is very reactive, but it's a manageable reaction, as we'll be able to see by the following table, which will show the uh, enthalpies of reaction, and the larger uh, the negative value for the enthalpy of reaction, the more aggressive the reaction that takes place. And we'll see in the final case is bromine. So bromine of the three halogens for which we commonly perform free radical halogenation is the least reactive, but it will still take place with methane and giving this type of overall reaction. Please see the following table, which lists the computed values for the free radical halogenation of methane by the various halogens. 
in our next reaction, we have the next longer alkane, ethane, with two carbons, reacting with a halogen, specifically chlorine in this case, to give chloroethane plus hydrogen chloride as products. Note that all six of the hydrogens in ethane are symmetry equivalent, so doesn't matter which one of the hydrogens is abstracted, we get an identical product, chloroethane. Next, we consider the reaction of our halogen with propane, which has three carbons. Here, something interesting occurs in that one, two, three, four, five, six of the hydrogens are primary hydrogens, but we have two hydrogens that are attached to the central secondary carbon, which makes them secondary hydrogens. So we have two different types of hydrogens that might be abstracted by the halogen. In the first case, if it abstracts a primary halogen, we end up with a compound like this. We have a primary haloalkane, such as 1-bromopropane and hydrogen bromide. In case two, we end up with the secondary haloalkane, so we end up with the 2-bromopropane. In the case of fluorine, both of these occur because both of the reactions are extremely exothermic being it's reacting with fluorine. In the case of chlorine also, both of these are so exothermic that chlorine will react both with primary and secondary hydrogens. In the case of bromine though, bromine is more selective. Each of these reactions is exothermic, but there's a sufficient difference in exothermicity that it vastly prefers to react with a secondary hydrogen than with a primary hydrogen to the extent that um, in this particular reaction, overwhelmingly any product we will get would be the secondary, the 2-bromopropane. Please see the following figures which show reactants and products for uh, the reaction of propane with the various halogens. The next reaction involves N or normal butane. So this is the straight chain alkane reacting with a halogen, which we're showing uh, to be specific, fluorine in this case.
So again, in N-butane, we have one, two, three, four, five, six hydrogens on the outside, which are primary hydrogens. And then we have one, two, three, four hydrogens, which are secondary hydrogens. In the case of fluorine specifically, fluorine is so reactive that it will react with the primary hydrogens to give a one fluorobutane plus HF. And also, even more likely, the secondary two fluorobutane. Both of these are so overwhelmingly exothermic that it'd be difficult to control the reaction under normal circumstances. If we had instead used chlorine, chlorine not as reactive as fluorine, but also not very selective either, in which case it's so exothermic for both primary and secondary hydrogens that we will get a mixture of products if we use chlorine as our halogen. In the case of bromine, bromine is more selective. While both reactions are exothermic, uh, the first reaction is only barely exothermic. And since the second reaction is far more favored, we're more likely to get uh, a higher yield of the two bromobutane than one bromobutane if we use bromine as our halogen. Please see the following figures showing the computed structures of reactants and products for reaction with N-butane. Now let us replace our N-butane with another isomer, 2-methylpropane. We notice here we have, again, two different types of hydrogens. Along the perimeter, we have three, six, nine hydrogens, which are primary hydrogens. And then we have one hydrogen, which is attached to a tertiary carbon, which makes it a tertiary hydrogen. So reacting with our halogen, we're gonna show chlorine as a specific example here, we have two possible products. One of the products involves replacement one of the many um, primary hydrogens to give a 1-chloro-2-methylpropane as a product, plus HCl. And in the second case, if we abstract and replace the tertiary hydrogen, we end up with a tertiary butyl chloride, plus HCl. If we have either fluorine or chlorine, both of these reactions are so exothermic that both of these are going to be achieved in high yield. In the case of bromine, because bromine is less reactive than chlorine, and is also more selective, and even third, the reactivity for all the halogens is most reactive for tertiary hydrogens, which is greater than for secondary hydrogens, which is greater than for primary hydrogens, which is greater than for methyl hydrogens. So because of that, in bromine, bromine will overwhelmingly form 
case two here and we would get the tertiary butyl bromide in preference to the uh, one bromo two uh, methyl propane. Uh, here, so we see the selectivity and lower reactivity of bromine compared to chlorine and fluorine come out most specifically in the case where we're reacting with something like this in a 2-methyl propane. Please see the following structures of the reactants and products for the reactings, reactions of 2-methyl propane with the various halogens. We have already encountered some of the difficulties we might face using free radical halogenation uh, to be synthetically useful. In the first case, we saw that fluorine is just so overwhelmingly reactive that it's dangerous to use. Chlorine is not quite so dangerous, but it's so reactive that it will react with uh, tertiary, secondary, or primary hydrogens relatively indiscriminately. Bromine has the disadvantage of being uh, not quite as reactive as the other halogens can be, but it has the advantage of being more selective, so it preferentially will react with tertiary hydrogens uh, significantly more than secondary and significantly more than primary. Are there any other challenges to using free radical halogenation? Yes, there is, which we will illustrate using the simplest of the alkanes, methane. And specifically, we're writing it with bromine as our halogen, but the same uh, factors take place for chlorine and fluorine as well. So, recap what we already know is that we can have bromine dissociates into free radicals. It will abstract a hydrogen from methane to form a methyl free radical, which will later combine with a bromine atom to form bromomethane, or methyl bromide. So far, so good. But, we generally run the reaction with an excess of the halogen. So what happens if our product, methyl bromide, encounters more bromine, which has dissociated into very reactive free radical bromine atoms? If a molecule of bromomethane encounters more unreacted bromine, 
it can react as well, uh, abstract a hydrogen and replace it with a bromine atom to give dibromomethane plus HBr. In fact, the enthalpy of a reaction for the second reaction is greater than for the first reaction. So we see that starting with methane, we are not restricted to getting the single product of bromomethane, but we can get a side reaction where we get further bromination of the product to yield the dibromo compound. Well, if that is true, what happens if the dibromomethane encounters more bromine? If the dibromomethane encounters more bromine, it will react to form bromoform or tribromomethane plus HBr. And very often, as a general rule, for each of the halogens, as we add more halogen to the alkane to get the haloalkanes, the haloalkanes are usually, not always, but usually more reactive towards free radical halogenation than the unsubstituted alkanes were. So once we form methyl bromide, the tendency for methyl bromide to form dibromomethane is even more uh, pronounced than for the initial reaction. And then when we get to the dibromo compound, we get to the tribromo. So starting just with methane and the halogen, we end up with a mixture of products. The tribromomethane, if it encounters excess bromine, can react and react favorably to form the tetrabromomethane. So we see here, uh, writ large, the danger of polysubstitution. So how do we avoid this problem to get the maximum benefit of using free radical halogenation? Well, if we're interested in getting the polyhalogenated compounds, we want to use a relatively small amount of our initial alkane and use a very great excess of the halogen. That will maximize the tendency to get the tri and the tetra halo alkanes. Or if we use uh, larger alkanes, the polyhalogenated compounds. On the other hand, if we want to restrict our product to the monohalogenated compound, we want to use a minimum amount of the halogen and use a huge excess of the initial alkane. Please see the following structures which show uh, reactants and products for the various uh, polysubstitution reactions that can and do take place with the halogens. Please see the following tables, which show the computed enthalpies of reactions for the various uh, reactions that we've discussed in this video involving fluorine, chlorine, and or bromine. And you'll see the general trends that fluorine is by far the most reactive. We see this as the most exothermic for each of the comparable reactions that we see that 
chlorine is the next most reactive, and then finally that bromine is the least reactive. And then for uh, keeping the halogen the same in each case, we see that the uh, greatest enthalpies of reaction involve abstraction of the tertiary hydrogens, which is more pronounced than for the secondary hydrogens, which is more pronounced for the primary hydrogens. Last but not least, we see the tendency that once we've halogenated an alkane, it tends to be uh, very often even more favorable to further halogenation. It's not a general rule that uh, it always is increasingly more exothermic, but relative to the initial alkane, once we put one halogen on, it tends to be uh, generally more reactive than the unsubstituted alkane was, and it's still sufficiently reactive even when we put many halogens onto it that side reactions are a significant and annoying side problem. I thank you very, very much for your attention. Have a good one.